So in, in today's talk, I'd like to introduce you first um, um, a very basic evolutionary game to introduce the concept of strategies, payoffs, and so on. And then I will give a few examples about the application of evolutionary game theory in helping us understanding biological interactions, um, ranging from, for example, the competition and coexistence of different bacterial strains to um, the relationships and uh, conflicts and behaviors of male and females in sexually reproducing animals. So let's start from a symmetric two-player coordination game um, that to decide which um, um, to drive on the left side or right side of the street. This is a very simple example with two players, um, the focal player and uh, his opponent. They could either decide to drive on the left or right side of the road when they approach it, each other. So if they both um, drive on the left then they uh, or on the right, they will be able to pass each other and this is success. So they each get a score of one. If um, they um, choose different um, ways, so one drive on the left and the other drive on the right, they will not be able to pass each other and they have to stop. So they get um, a score of zero. And those ones and zeros are called payoffs. Um, so this example is really simple, but it illustrates a fundamental idea in evolutionary games. And that is the focal player's payoff depend on not only what the, play, the focal player itself does, but also the opponent. So there's no obvious best strategy that an in, individual can do. Um, we can then extend from two players to a population. We consider um, a general game of a payoff matrix between strategy A and B. So the frequency of A player in the population is X. The frequency of B player in the population is then one minus X. Uh, in this way, we can calculate the average payoff of each strategy and um, the average payoff of the whole population. Um, the frequency changing rate of strategy A can be modeled then by uh, the product of the current frequency of A strategy in the population and the difference between the payoff of A strategy and the population average. So if um, the A strategy does better than the population average, then its frequency will increase, otherwise it's going to decrease. Um, and this is the same for other strategies in the population. Um, we call this the replicator equation. Um, this is probably one of the most often used, um, um, most often used um, a way to mo model population dynamics in evolutionary game models. Um, this is really a very simple approach, and you might have already thinking, is that does this uh, approach um, correspond to any real world scenarios? Um, the answer is yes, and it can be actually quite literally. So on this day, September 3rd of 1967, in Sweden, they decided to, to change the driving uh, rules from driving on the left to driving on the right. And that's happened on their main street in Stockholm. So many people, the whole population of people are trying to figure out their best strategy in this chaos. Okay, so let's then move on to a few examples of uh, my own study of evolutionary games. Um, the first example is um, um, bacterial interactions uh, in the mic. In, in the microbiota of the freshwater hydra. Um, so we, many of you probably have heard that the natural um, microbiota on our skin and uh, in our gut, those microbes can protect us from infection by the pathogenic microbes. And this is the same also for other species like the freshwater hydro, this little animal you can see on the left side of the um, picture. Okay, um, I, I hear some background uh, people asking something, so I was uh, maybe maybe not. <laughs> okay, um, I will continue. Um, okay, so um, 
we have um, this is the same for the hydra and um, we can see that with the natural microbiota on the surface the hydra is uh, healthy and uh, happy um, but we can make it germ-free by applying a lot of antibiotics to kill all the bacteria, for example. And then uh, afterwards, this uh, germ-free hydra can be easily infected oh, yeah. by, um, um, by a fungus, and this fungus can kill the, uh, can kill the, the animal. Um, our collaborators was interested in why the protection can work. So what they did is to isolate different uh, species of uh, bacteria from the hydromicrobiota and uh, put those strains one by one back to the germ-free hydra. And they could, of course, there are many different species, but they started for, from the most so I will start, uh, try to continue. Um, so um, with this, we can see that if you only put back C bacteria or D bacteria, um, the fungal infection rate is still very high. That means, um, um, so this bacteria, if they are put back to the germ-free animal alone, they can't prevent uh, bacterial uh, fungal infection. But if you put these two bacteria together back to the hydra, um, it can have um, a very dramatic effect. So the fungal infection rate have dropped to almost the same level as the natural microbiota. This is a very interesting result. And um, our collaborators were interested in what um, these two bacteria uh, are playing because uh, they are supposed to share exactly the same ecological niche and how could they coexist and what game they play. So they came to us and asked us to, you know, could you make a model to help us figure it out? So what we did is we went, we asked them to do some co-culture experiments, starting um, to put these two strains of bacteria together and starting from a, a gradient of uh, initial frequencies ranging from zero to one. Um, and uh, for, and we want to look how the frequency of C bacteria uh, change over time. We can see that um, if we start from high frequency, like the green trajectories, um, the frequency of C bacteria will keep high in the population. Otherwise, if you start from relatively low frequency, the C bacteria will decrease in frequency um, and eventually approach close to zero. Um, and this actually looks very much similar to the coordination game we have saw in the beginning. Um, so very simple, problem solved. So we went to our collaborators and told them, you know, um, your bacteria are playing this uh, coordination game. But they told us, no, you're wrong. Um, you have also to look at the density dynamics. And that's what happened. So uh, at the beginning of the experiment, they start from here. So the, no matter um, in which case, eventually the C bacteria dominate or D bacteria dominates, they start from low density of both bacteria. And over the time, they both grow in density following the blue or green trajectories. But um, um, in, in both cases, um, the density of both bacteria grow. It, no species goes extinct. So we're not dealing with a um, coordination game where there are two stable boundary um, strategies, but a um, uh, game where you have two internal fixed points. It looks like that. So we have to go back to, to change, to modify our model. And this time we used a lot of quaternary equations instead, because it has um, intimate mapping between uh, replicator equations. So we can easily link to game dynamics. And at the same time, uh, it has a benefit of having parameters that are easy um, to, be to, be, to be measured in experiments, like the growth rate and uh, carrying capacities. So um, we could analyze the log Kivotera equations, and we found out that um, in order to produce two coexisting states, internal coexisting states, 
we require that the maximum growth rate of the bacteria during the exponential growing stage must be frequency dependent, something like this, like with two intercepts between zero and one. And we told this to our collaborators, of course, they don't believe us. This is um, for microbiologists, this had no reason, but somehow we convinced them to do some experiments and um, to measure the growth rate during the exponential growth phase for the C and D bacteria, starting from the different initial frequencies. Um, and then we feed the data to general linear models uh, and select the best model. Um, what we found out is um, it was true that the growth rate of the two bacteria are frequency dependent and they have two intercepts. So uh, eventually with lot Quetera dynamics and frequency dependent growth rate, we could uh, make a model that fits the data very well and we get a paper published. But the question remains that why the frequency, um, why the growth rate should be frequency dependent. So our collaborators moved on to investigate this question. Um, so what they did is they sequenced the bacteria and they found a prephage, um, like basically the phage sequence in the genome of the C bacteria. And they found out that C bacteria can produce phage particles by budding. So there might be a, a hidden player in the system. So what they thought is um, C and D bacteria, they both consume the common nutrient in the, in the uh, medium. Um, the C bacteria produce um, phage by induction, um, basically budding, so the phage doesn't kill it. But the phage particles can infect D bacteria and D bacteria will be infected and um, the, the phage enters the lytic cycle uh, eventually the cell of D bacteria explode and release many more phage particles. Um, if this is the case, we can write down the differential equations in a quite uh, straightforward ways. And we could also relatively easily measure the growth rate um, of C bacteria, D bacteria, um, and the killing rate of the D bacteria by the phage um, all the other parameters except the induction rate of um, um, phage particles by the C bacteria, uh, which could um, probably depend on C or D or a combination of them, um, because uh, it's very difficult to quantify um, the density of phage uh, over time. So what we could do is to find the mathematically simplest form of this induction function that can produce the results that we observe in the experiments. So um, what we did is to try different forms of the induction rate function. Of course, we start from a constant, it doesn't work. And then we tried a linear function of the frequency of C bacteria in the in the population and then it worked. So um, in this case, if we only consider the lytic life cycle of the phages, we can see that the growth rate of Duganella, this bacteria is an increasing function. Um, otherwise, if we only consider the lit uh, lysogenic life cycle, basically the, the left side here, this lytic life cycle of phage, um, the growth rate of the Duganella bacteria is a decreasing function. So, um, but if we combine the lytic cycle and the lysogenic life cycles of the phage, we could have this um, a result of frequency dependent growth rate of the Duganella, first increase and then decrease and cross with the growth rate of Carebecta um, in, in the uh, at two different places. This corresponds very well to what we have measured in the experiments. So um, eventually combining all these two, that is both studies, we found out that these two bacteria could um, coexist despite they consume the same um, nutrient. They compete on the same uh, nutrient. Um, because this slowly growing bacteria holds the phage and the phage can infect the faster growing bacteria and release more phage particles in the self reinforcement uh, way. So this is basically like the slowly growing 
um, bacteria pay some cost to produce a weapon against this fast growing competitor. And at this point, um, I was super impressed by how evolution can produce such an elegant and smart um, solutions to the coexistence problem. Okay, so um, the games between bacteria are also quite interesting, still very simple. Now we are going to venture into the world of the sexually reproducing animals and um, to analyze more complicated relationships. Um, because the models and examples we're going to cover are quite complex, I will not present the whole model, but uh, I will focus on introducing the kind of problems that evolutionary game theory can be applied to solve and um, some results from the models. Um, for those of you who are interested, at, uh, interested in the nitty gritty details, I have some examples also for you. So our first example is about uh, sexual selection. We know that sexual selection can be good for the population because um, females, they choose um, 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 their the attractive males and um, males compete to be chosen. And um, the winner of the males probably carry the good genes that can benefit the offsprings in the next generation. Therefore, in this way, females can select the good genes to pass on to the next generation. But um, um, the, the trait that makes males attractive sometimes carry a cost. For example, like the antler of deer. And because the structure is heavy, it can um, make the, the male deer slow when um, predator comes and it can be heavy and cumbersome so that it's, it has a disadvantage in foraging. Um, there are some hypotheses. People have um, guessed that uh, the Irish elk, which is already extinct, like in the figure and on the right side, probably could be due to a set effect of sexual selection. So the antler grows bigger and bigger. Eventually, this doesn't work anymore. All the males went extinct. So, um, but in the previous models, people have always assumed that good genes are good for all, um, not only for the, um, for the male, but also for the female. And also all females have the same preference. Um, they have the same taste for what kind of a male they want to mate with. But um, we know this is not true because, um, for example, people have already found in the red deer uh, related species, um, males are high fitness, father daughters are low fitness. Um, so this is called interlocal sexual conflict. And um, this does not uh, only happen in the deers, but also across the tree of life from insects to mammals to birds. They found many, many of those examples. So good genes for males might be detrimental for females and vice versa. And also we know that female preference can be very complex and not all females have the same taste. Um, I can I can uh, prove this from the Disney movies. You see that uh, some females prefer prince, some prefer the frog, and some like the mediocre man, and some like the really extreme cases. Um, so how to capture those um, complicated female preference? This is a detail, mathematical detail I could show you. Like for example, using the beta distribution function, we can model. Um, um, variety of female preference just using two parameters. Depending on the parameter choice, the female preference function can be an increasing function, a decreasing function, having a maximum in the middle or a minimum in the middle. So normally increase alpha will increase female preference for the um, high quality males and increasing beta makes female prefer more of the um, low quality, uh, low condition males. So with this uh, under interlocus sexual conflict, that means uh, there are alleles that are beneficial for females but detrimental for males and vice versa. There are conditions that um, females can naturally evolve to prefer princes, the high condition males. So um, a game interaction comes 
in here because we really uh, let may females of different strategies to compete and then this naturally evolve um, so that females prefer high condition males in this case um, it can also find we can we could also find situations where females for example prefer the low condition males but in this case we can see um, at the allele um, value dif distribution figure on the right side. If we um, force the female to mate randomly in the population, it will accumulate the alleles that are beneficial for females but detrimental for males. But if we let females to freely choose, they will choose a high um, condition males. Only those males, they get um, a chance to mate. So as a set effect, um, the male beneficial but female detrimental alleles will accumulate in the population, leading to a um, whole population of females of suboptimal uh, condition. And if this escalate, it can lead to the decrease of population growth rate and maybe eventually leading to um, a tragedy of commons and uh, the extinction of the species. So this is our first uh, example. Uh, of the in the in animals of sexually reproducing animal species um, but um, a life is not full of tragedies there are also altruism and our second example is about um, the evolution of altruistic behaviors between um, males and females and we will see whether um, um, the male animals can evolve, for example, to leave home, disperse away early, uh, despite the death rate is high, so that the sisters in the natal habitat can have a better um, fitness later on. Um, in the previous uh, models, normally we have this um, common assumption that males fight for females and females fight for food. This is, of course, true because males need females to produce offspring and females, they convert food into, into the next generation. But normally people very often ignore a fact that is um, quite uh, interesting that males, they need food too. For example, in this uh, Southern um, elephant seal, males can even be eight times heavier than females. Of course, they eat a lot of food that can be otherwise consumed by the females. Um, so we want to take into this fact in our uh, model. So uh, at that time, we even called this project uh, males need food too. So in this model, we assume that males may consume more or less food per um, time step than females do. For example, in the elephant seal case, the male will consume more uh, food than the female. And we assume this doesn't evolve. This is just the characteristic of the species. Um, but the dispersal probability and uh, timing can evolve. And we are considering a metapopulation model where individuals, they uh, have a, a natal population, uh, natal habitat, and at some point they might disperse to go to other habitats. Um, and the life cycle starts from reproduction um, and then uh, at later time steps, they can consume food and make a decision if they will uh, disperse. If they disperse early, then you leave more resources on the natal habitat for your kin, but um, the mortality rate can be high. But uh, if you decide to disperse later, you're in better condition, um, but you have been like uh, competing for food with your brothers and sisters. Um, another thing that we have to consider in the model is whether males and females, they eat from the same pot or different ones, because when male and female, they compete for food, eat, eating from the same pot, normally it's what happens is not like in the, in the animation, it's more like, uh, like this. Um, there will be severe competition between the males and females, they fight with each other. So. Um, then I will present you the result. So on the left side, under the classic assumptions, where we assume that males and females don't uh, impact the food consumption of each other. Um, and on the right side, we'll present result of the more realistic scenarios where male and female, they fight for food. 
On the upper panel, we present the difference on, between female and male in dispersal probability. And on the lower panel is the difference in dispersal timing. Um, so you can ignore for the moment the x-axis, just focusing on the y-axis. So above the dotted line, males, they eat more food than females. And below the dotted line, males, they eat less than females. And the result is relatively straightforward to, to understand. If males, for example, eat more than females, um, they accumulate body condition slower than females. So dispersal becomes more dangerous and more costly for them. So in this case, female would evolve to disperse more often and also earlier. But what happens if uh, there are competition between males and females, we can see that um, um, sex difference in dispersal probability have disappeared and males evolve um, to, e to disperse actually earlier than females when they consume more food and this corresponds to the scenario, for example, male altruistically disperse earlier to leave more resources for their um, sisters. Um, for uh, example, in the animal world would be the great bastard. This bird male can be twice as heavy as females. And uh, also at the cheek, when they are cheeks, the males they disperse much earlier than females and uh, suffer from high dispersal mortality. Okay, um, now we have discussed the two examples, one is about the tragedy of the commons and then uh, the evolution of altruistic behaviors. Um, I give you the last example um, that's uh, about the conflict between males and females in terms of paternity. We know that in species of monogam socially monogamous species like humans, females benefit from male in investment in parental care, in resources, but sometimes they mate with the males other than their social partner, and this creates uh, the tension and conflict. For example, that like this recent paper have shown in some um, human populations um, that, um, for example, in the com community of Himba pastoralists, uh, we can find that um, almost half of the offspring produced uh, extra pair and 70% of the couples have at least one child that is extra pair. Um, and in animals, it's um, also quite often this can happen. So penguins we know almost uh, have become a symbol of long lasting love and commitment um, for many people, but scientists have found out that actually a third of the offspring on uh, average are produced not with a social partner. And uh, things get even worse in the tree sparrows. About 50% of the offspring is not from the social pair. Um, you can see probably why this male seems to be quite angry at his female. Uh, things get even more interesting in the fish. For example, in this uh, African cichlid fish, um, there are two kinds of males. And this uh, beautiful, magnificent uh, male, it, make, um, it, it does make um, uh, a nest for the females to lay eggs um, and he will invest in the, taking care of those eggs for example uh, finding the water so that um, there are um, fresh water circulation to provide oxygen and it will also defend the eggs from predators and also um, cleaning the eggs so that parasites don't infect them there's also another type of male um, that's called the sneakers they don't build nests and they don't even look like males. They um, look like females and they sneak into the nest of the males pretending to be female, um, but instead of um, releasing eggs, they release sperm, basically to steal the paternity from the nest building and um, brood carrying male. And they found um, those males, they lose on average almost 40% of paternity in their broods. So how could this evolve? Why males still provide care if they lose so much fertility? We, we then made a model um, of game interactions between females, brood tending males, and the, and the sneakers. We found under the condition if the extra pair offspring have higher value than the within pair offspring, for example, because female want to uh, um, 
have more diversity in their uh, offspring. Um, um, and um, male mate guarding, guarding of their paternity is not perfect. Um, then we could see um, starting from a low frequency of sneakers, the, the um, frequency can increase. And at the same time, the median level of male help from the um, brood carrying males can evolve to almost one and female fidelity evolved to almost zero. And um, eventually the extra pair offspring frequency uh, stabilized at around 40%. That is very close to what they have observed in the, in the fish case. Um, but if we change the parameter values and the scenarios, we can see that um, uh, instead of uh, approaching an evolutionary stable strategy um, or evolutionary stable state, um, there can be cycles. Um, so in this case, uh, we assume that sneaker, they have a mating advantage. Basically, they are Mr. Casanova. Females prefer to mate with them. Um, and in this case, the offspring of extra pair and within pair offspring have the same value for the females. We can see um, um, the process is a bit like uh, the Fisher and sexy sun dynamics. We can um, illustrate how this can work. So starting from uh, here, uh, with both males have high um, provide a lot of parental care and females to be relatively loyal. Um, at this time, females can take advantage of the high quality help from their uh, social mate and mate with those uh, uh, sneakers. Um, because the inheritance, the offspring of those females, they are more like, when they are sons, they are more likely to be sneakers. When they are daughters, they are less likely to be loyal. So this is a reinforcement uh, process so that um, the frequency of sneakers increase in the population and uh, female fidelity drop. If females are not loyal to their uh, ma uh, male partner, it doesn't pay off for males to help the females. So the male health also decrease. Um, the sneakers, they are basically reproductive parasite and their strategy is self-defeating when there's no host, there's parasite uh, can also not sustain. So their um, frequency decrease as well. And when everything collapses at this time, uh, females that, that are relatively loyal have a relative advantage because they produce less of those sneaker signs um, and relatively more of the normal males that um, potentially provide parental care. And they also produce uh, female offspring that are relatively more loyal to their social partner. In, with this self-reinforcement, um, the system recovered again so that female fidelity increased leading males to invest more in, in their um, parental care. So um, both increase until the cycle kicks in again um, and the sneakers invade the, the population. So um, and start, um, so the cycle goes on. Um, so in this talk, I present you quite a few different examples, starting from an um, introduction of very simple coordination game where we introduced different um, concepts in evolutionary games, such as payoff metrics, um, um, different strategies, payoffs, um, replicator dynamics. Um, and then we went on to the first example of the population dynamics of uh, competition and coexistence of different bacteria. Um, and then we um, talked about an uh, example where we uh, let females of different mating preference to compete uh, and to show the two sides of uh, sexual selection. On the one hand, it could um, um, help the population fitness by passing on the good genes. But on the other hand, um, the sexual selection of females can escalate into a tragedy of the commons when there's um, uh, intralocal sexual conflict. In this case, it might even lead to population extinction. And eventually, uh, and after that, we um, considered a case where food competition can lead to the altruistic early dispersal of males. 
And here the game happens um, between uh, females and males and early dispersal individuals and later dispersal individuals. Um, and um, we show the example of the bird, um, great bastard that follow this life history. Um, eventually we, we provided an uh, example of um, the evolution of male health and fe female fidelity um, and uh, like uh, different alternative male strategies like uh, the care providing males and uh, the casinovas. Um, they are game interactions in the population. So all those examples are quite diverse. And um, now we end up summarizing a few take home messages that I want I hope that you can remember. So um, I give this example with the aim to show that game theory can be applied to study many uh, seemingly very different scenarios. But uh, they have one thing in common is that um, there's no best strategy and everybody's best behavior really depends on um, what the others are doing in the population. And the second thing is um, theoreticians can benefit really a lot from collaborating with empiricists and reading the papers because um, we really uh, won't find the interesting dynamics, for example, in the bacteria game. An example, if it just didn't hear the advice in looking at the density dynamics. And also in the next example, um, we could learn uh, we, we kind of incorporated the biological factor that there are genetic conflicts between males and females, that not all good genes are good for everyone. And also, for example, we could also consider the competition of food between males and females and different male mating strategies. Um, all of those you can benefit, you can discover the um, knowledge gaps by reading empirical papers or collaborating with, with empiricists. And also the last point is um, what I think um, that's most important for me in my research um, is not only to focus on the evolutionary stable strategy, um, which have been a very important topic in evolutionary game theory, but um, I think it's also important to look at the evolutionary dynamics itself uh, over even over short time scales, uh, for example, especially under climate change or human disturbance, um, under changing environment. In those cases, the game itself can change over time, and uh, it makes sense to follow the dynamics and maybe even um, trying to think of um, intervention processes. For example, um, if we in, we predict the evolutionary stable state will be the extinction of a species. We shouldn't wait until the population went extinct. We should um, probably think of, about uh, intervention strategies. What can we do to, um, to rescue the species or um, promote population growth? And this should uh, work within a few years or a few decades. And that's what uh, I think most interesting. Um, and with this, I would like to finish the talk um, and uh, you're welcome to ask questions.